yeah, yeah. It seemed like the Lord was among us in a special way, and uh, we're glad for that. We sang that last song about um, a God who would have to show us about his love. And I was thinking about the song before that, about this God who's reckless and basically, with no regard for how it affects him, loves us. I want to say that again because, again, the author of the song I was listening to, and, and this is kind of the, uh, some of the things that he was thinking about when he wrote it. When we sing about a reckless God, it's a God who had no concern for how it would affect him negatively when he decided to love us. It's like he put himself over here in order to pursue us at the greatest expense to himself. And sometimes when we sing that song, it frustrates me because I'm like, I don't get that. I don't fully understand that. I really want to, but I don't. I need my eyes open. And the Lord encouraged me today, like, like he's, he's going to do that. And we sang that second song about open up our eyes that we would be able to see the wonder of that God. And so it's our prayer that God would be opening up your eyes even now so that you might be able to see the wonder of that God. Because if, if you miss the wonder of that God, you've missed the better party. We're talking a lot about the better party here at the Avenue Church, and we're trying to throw the better party. Everything we do is all about like, hey man, how can we throw the better party? Because we believe that when we throw the better party, whether it's in worship or preaching or after Easter service or whatever the case may be, when we um, exhibit that there's something special and different and new going on about us, it shows the world that the kingdom of God has come. Because the real better party is the kingdom of God. And we're just giving tangible evidence that it lives here and among us. And so for you to think about this idea of the better party, for you to really understand, you have to understand who is at the center of the better party. And it's that reckless God who will continue to open up our eyes that we may understand his love for you and for me. We're in this series called um, Being All In. And we're talking about some of the different things that, that we need to pursue in order to see the vision for 2018 become a reality, which is radical gospel renewal for both ourselves, our homes, and our cities. And um, the last piece in the series is, is this idea that we're, we're working through called reimagining evangelism, where you may have had an idea of this is what evangelism is, but we're actually, we want to reimagine that together, biblically based, but we want to reimagine that um, together, and our definition for reimagining evangelism is becoming relationally relevant in the loving demonstration and declaration of the gospel. We've had two messages so far, this is before Easter, on, on the demonstration. We'll have another on the demonstration. Today is going to be more about the declaration. What is the gospel? How do we share the gospel? And hopefully we'll give you a tool that you can take that will actually help walk you through the gospel, not only to yourself, but to those you may dearly want to share the gospel with. So we talked a lot about the better party, but today we're going to talk about the better invite. The better invite. How can we actually get better at inviting people to this party? Hey, so if you, if you want to look at your outline, we have a, a normal outline that we have. We're going to have some blanks and spaces for you to take notes. But do me, a, do me a favor. Flip it over real quick. Flip that thing over real quick. What does it say on the back? I, I can't hear you. All right, let's read it together on the three. Ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> That's awesome. You guys said it exactly how you should have. Because I think that's sometimes how I invite people to the better party. That's kind of sometimes my vibe. Not in here, because I can get amped up in here. Because I'm, I'm like with the fam. Walk into some amazing worship. And, so I'm, I'm all about it in here. I'm talking about out there with people who, who have yet to be invited to the better party. What do you notice about that invite? Well, first of all, there's a, there's a typo. I don't think that's how you spell party, unless you're trying to uh, make a point. Um, there <coughs> doesn't seem to be a lot of urgency with that invite, right? It's like, so if you don't really have anything else going on, come to this, come to, come to my party. You know, like, it's cool. And it's cool if you don't, it's totally cool if you don't. But, but if you want to, and you have nothing else going on, you can, you can kind of check us out. Also in this invite, there's no instructions on how to get there. You don't know where the party is. 
You don't know who's going to be there. You have no idea about the party besides what the invitation tells you. And here's what the invitation tells you. I don't really believe in my own party. And I'm certainly not equipped to help get you there. That's a problem. That's a problem, man. If we're going to say that our lives are about this better party, and we've been transformed, and like it's all about this relentless God who never gives up on us and absolutely has taken us from death to life, we should, we should be incredibly excited to help other people enter this party. We should know how people can enter this party. We should be able to walk people through the directions from where they are to where this party is. We should be equipped and excited to do that rather than sending out invitations like I have in the past. If that invitation came to you in the mail, you would be confused. You might think there was like a creeper out after you. Like, what, this is weird. You might call the police. You'd be like, yo, come to my party. Then better idea. You would start wondering about old enemies who might be like trying to get back at you for something. Like, what is this? Is this some weird, you know, sort of like crazy creeper movie that's happening to me? You, you wouldn't know what to do with that invite. And so we want to avoid that as we start talking about inviting people to the better party. Man, we want to... We want to be able to have the better invite. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, and if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. We're going to be working through a passage that um, might be familiar to you, might be new, but it's a very important um, passage as we start talking about uh, what the gospel is. And I want to take a second to talk about the word gospel before we hop in. The word gospel means good news. It's actually an Old Testament word. It's not a New Testament word. Let me just define reality before we keep going. Two things. I don't have much of a voice, so I apologize for the cracking and the squeaking and things like that. Being a part of two baseball teams that my son is on, has, now we're reaping the benefits of that. So, number two, and a cold. Number two, um, there's, all, there's already been a couple of like really um, enjoyable comments about my shirt, and it's totally cool if you're thinking one. I've been asked, if, did I get a free G.I. Joe, Joe guy with this shirt? Um, my wife asked if Bob Lane is going to pick me up and go hunting after the service. Um, and then there was the, oh, I can't see you. Okay, so if you have a better one, man, I would love to hear it. If you're online and you're watching, just text it in to the, to the Avenue Church, do it to our website, um, but because, because that, that's awesome. Okay, and so just defining those two realities uh, before we go on. Now let's, let's take a look at um, 1 Corinthians 15. Now before we do that, we have to know who the author is. You might know um, the Apostle Paul. You might not. But you probably know Mitch. Mitch is a guy who runs around here a lot, does a lot of work. He's one of our pastors here. And if you know Mitch, then you know what you need to know probably about the Apostle Paul. You could learn a little bit more about the Apostle Paul, but for today's purposes, <clears throat> if you know Mitch, and if you know Mitch's story, then you know what you need to know about the Apostle Paul. Because Mitch, self-admittedly, was a party animal. Back in the day when he was riffing and running, he was a party animal. He would be the guy like next to the keg. He, this is, I'm not, I'm not making this up because these are his words, next to the keg, giving out high fives. Like he was the guy who was at the center of the party, looking for the party, um, just loving a good party. And you know that if you love a good party, most of the time you'll do whatever you can to get to that good party. True? So the thing about Mitch is he just found a better party. And he left the one, but took a lot of those same traits to the better party. I'm going to invite you guys to do the same thing because that's what our Apostle Paul does. Our Apostle Paul, he's just the better party animal. You've got to realize that about the Apostle Paul, man. Like, he understood <clears throat> what it was to live with passion, to live with vigor, to be all in on this side of Jesus, so that when he came and met Jesus, he was all in on this side. And so he writes from that perspective of this is a guy who understands the better party because he is actually the better party animal. And so when he writes to the crowd in, in Corinth, it's a church that they were kind of known for partying, not in a good way, sort of like the old days party. They were kind of known for that. I Man, Paul's able to speak into that with authority because he had been there. He had done that. He had been a part of all that. And he's like, listen, I've got something better for you. 
And so he writes to this huge party crowd in Corinth, and he's, he's inviting them to this better party, and he's actually telling them how to get there and where it is. Check this out with me, uh, verse 1 in chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Okay, so here, in this first part, we see that, that Paul is going to talk about the word gospel. And as we said, gospel means good news. And in the Old Testament, what it meant was, it actually can be tied to this passage from in Isaiah, where Babylon has kind of taken over and burned everything down in Jerusalem. But there's a promise given to these Old Testament Israelites. And here's the promise. Look for one. There's going to be one that, that comes, and, and he's going to have beautiful feet. And their feet are going to be beautiful because they bring good news. They bring gospel of a victory, of a, of a Messiah who will restore all things. And so the word gospel, it, it started in the Old Testament with God's people looking for this good news, looking for this one who would restore all that had been taken from them. And, and so Paul knows who that person is. Paul understands the fulfillment of good news. It's Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah, who has come and he has restored what was lost. Now, not physically, but spiritually, he has brought the kingdom of God to bear. And will one day, when he comes again, bring it to fullness. And at the center of this good news is his death and resurrection, which makes it possible for people like me and for people like you to enter in to the better party. That's the gospel that Paul talks about. Next verse, please. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Okay, so here we have the center of our good news. We have the directions, if you will, to the party. He, he's given them, we're going to walk our way through this passage, but, but here we can see we have the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, very much as first as first importance, Paul says. It's like, it's like out there, first and foremost, that this is what I have to preach because if you don't know where the party is or how to get to it, you really have nothing. Next, please. Um, next, next scripture, please. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Okay, so we just celebrated this, <clears throat> the historical resurrection of Christ. Next, please. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, <clears throat> for I am the least of the apostles. Paul understood what it meant to be on the other side of the gospel. Unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul wasn't just a party animal. He, he was a party animal to the degree that <clears throat> his party told him to wipe out the church. That's, that was, at, what was like at the center of his party. Next verse, please. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. How many of you can relate to that today? Awesome. Okay, cool. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. I love that. I received grace as a gift. And one of the, evidence, um, one of the evidences that I had really received grace was that I got to work. I worked harder than any of them. Not to earn it, not to keep it, because I fully understood who I was and what the relentless love of God had done to me. And now it was time for me to get to work. That's how Paul lived. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So it wasn't even Paul, this like, uh, we, we can't even applaud Paul. It's like, oh man, good work ethic. No, it was like, oh Paul, grace really got a hold of you. And not only saved you, but then and made you this new person all the way through and through. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. And so what we want to do today is we just, man, we just want to walk through this passage, especially some of the <clears throat> front end of it, and talk about uh, some things that hopefully will be helpful to you guys uh, in sharing the better invite. Um, and so you can see there on your, on your handout, um, you have a portion of this verse, <clears throat> which is where we're going to be camped out in. And from this verse, um, we walk away with a few concepts that are key to the gospel. Now, I want to say a few things uh, before, we, before we begin to walk through them. Uh, first of all, much of this material comes from uh, what, what's called the gospel boot camps. 
And it is a, um, it's like a workshop that was created by both David and Nori Nicholas. Um, uh, he was the founding pastor of Spanish River Church who's gone to be with Jesus. He's with Jesus right now. He is at the best party. Can't believe where he is right now. It's amazing where he is. Um, Nori is, she's still here at the lesser party, but at least the better party. Okay? And um, there's this uh, workshop, and it's got a workbook and things like that. And basically, um, what, he, what he realized was he felt like a lot of churches did a lot of things well, besides the better invite. Like they preached about God, they preached all these sort of different things that were really amazing. They had amazing aspects to them. But in his perspective, it was like, man, um, you're missing like the better invite. You're missing how people um, get to the better party. And so he developed this boot camp, basically, that now a ton of pastors have gone through worldwide. Um, and it, and it, what, he, what he did is he looked at this particular passage and he pulled out six themes that are elementary to the gospel. The gospel is actually, can, can be looked at in different perspectives than just these six themes, but it's not less than this. You know what I'm saying? So we're gonna look at this, and at the center of these six themes is the atonement. You can look at different themes in the gospel. You can look at um, justification, or adoption, or the justice of the gospel, or, or um, um, the ad adoption in the gospel. There's a, there's a whole ton of themes. The gospel of Tim Keller is like a, like a diamond. You can turn it, and it's the same diamond, but you can see different aspects of it. So, so what I want to say is, this is not all, it's not all aspects of the gospel, but you can't have the gospel without what I'm about to tell you. Anything less than this compromises the gospel. And so we want to walk you through uh, what some of these things are. There's six main themes with a final um, invitation that we're going to talk about at the end. And as I walk you through it, I'm not only giving you information, I'm actually sharing the gospel with you. So for some of you, this might be the first time you're hearing it, or it might be the 500th time. You should do two things. You should be a student of what you're hearing, but you should also be a recipient of it. You should be needful of what we're about to walk through. Now, these six themes come from this passage. If you have your Bibles and you want to do the biblical research with me, I'm going to do it real quick with you. Um, if you look at verse uh, uh, 1 there, you can underline the word, the gospel I preach to you, which you receive. You would stop there, and from that, you would get the idea that this is a gospel that's received by faith. Um, the next line says, in which you stand, going into verse 2, and by which you are being saved. So from there, we're going to get the concept of, like, there's no other way to be saved outside of Jesus. Like, your good works, they don't work. If you go down a little bit, you're going to see the word Christ. I also received, this is in verse 3, that Christ, and so we're going to talk about Christ. Like, who, who is Jesus? Why did he have to die? We're going to talk, talk a bit about that. And then we're going to see the word die, uh, die which is, brings up the topic of death. And so we're going to say, why is death a part of the gospel? Uh, why is it a, a very elementary part of the gospel? Uh, and then it says, for our sins, in that same sentence. And we're going to say, what does that mean? What is sin? And why did somebody have to die uh, for sin? And then finally, we're going to take a look at that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. We're going to take a look at, hey, so what? The resurrection. Why is that um, a big deal? So if you have your outline there, you'll, you'll see that there's space and little prompts um, next to those words, and that's that's space for you to write in some things, but, but these are also prompts that will help you as you share the gospel to remember two or three things about each of these sections. Um, the second page that you've got, not to necessarily be looked at right now, but to be looked at when you get home, is the full presentation of this. This is right out of the workbook. Um, it's a page that sort of has every one of these sections explained with a few sentences. And so I would encourage you to take some time today to read through that, to put that somewhere visual, so that you can begin to really get your mind and heart around this information. Because if you want to invite people to the better party, you need to know where it is and how to help people to get there. So let's work our way through this. Um, the first one, <coughs> sin. So we see the first, um, the first theme, and, and the way that David grouped these themes together was he grouped them together in bad news and good news. Has anybody ever told you, hey, I got some bad news and good news? Right? What do you normally want first? Uh, if you're like me, man, I want the bad news. Because you can tell me I just want a million bucks, but if I don't know the bad news, I'm like fixated on it until I know it. And as a matter of fact, in this case, it's the bad news that makes the good news so good. If we just hop to the good news, it actually becomes kind of mediocre news. Like, I can take or leave it. But when you, when you begin to understand the bad news, then you start to really understand why the good news is, is so good. So the first three are what we would call the bad news. Um, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> go to that slide behind me. Sin death works. Sin death works. Okay, and so uh, 
What you have to understand when, when we're thinking about the gospel and we're, we're making a better invite is that um, God created all things good. Man, it was an amazing party at the beginning. Adam and Eve, the animals, the vegetation. I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a marriage where it was like honeymoon style all the time. No clothes, no shame, no rules. Just don't, just don't hang over here near the street. Just, just prove to me that you actually want to choose me rather than life. Uh, name some animals, eat some amazing food, be with one another, be with me. I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you, we'll hang out. It will be amazing. And then um, something that the Bible calls sin entered the world. They, the guy didn't want robots, and so he gave humanity the opportunity to choose him or to choose to find life outside of him. And, and so the scripture tells us that humanity chose to find life outside of God. They were like, God, you're basically not enough. We believe that we can find something else and better over there. And so that's where they went. When sin entered the world, a ton of stuff happened. But you can't begin to understand the gospel without first understanding that all was once good, peaceful, and harmonious until sin entered. And until so humanity made a choice away from God. Uh, you can call that different things. Uh, you could call it crimes against God. You could call it um, choosing to find your life outside of God. Um, the, the biblical definition is like missing the mark, which I don't think is, uh, or that's the Greek word, but, but I don't think it does the word justice. Um, these are, David used to say, these are cosmic crimes against the high judge. So sin um, has entered the world. So the first concept here in the bad news is that um, by both heredity, like I inherited that sin nature from Adam and Eve, uh, and by choice, sin is now here. It's hard to make a strong argument against sin. And you, you could. You could say there's no sin in the world, but I don't know how you would explain like anything you're going to watch on like CNN or Fox tonight. See how I got you both there? <laughs> got my camo shirt on. Can't see me right now. <laughs> it's hard to explain that sin is not hereditary if you know my kids. I have awesome kids. They're super awesome. I just love them like crazy. But they're crazy sinners too. I mean, my, I'm not talking about my big ones. My big ones know Jesus. They're still crazy sinners too, but they, they, they've experienced, they're on the other side of the gospel. I'm talking about those little guys that hang out with me. They are so selfish. It's like all they think about is when they want to play with Play-Doh, when they want to eat, when they want their diaper change, and going outside and doing this and doing It's all about them. That doesn't make them like horrible kids. It just makes them human. And it reminds us that we, by nature, we by nature follow ourselves. We by nature want to be our own God. And, and we should embrace that. Because the more we try to moralize our way out of it, the less good news the gospel seems. And so where does that lead us? Well, it leads us to death. The second concept, you can see it there in your outline as well. Um, when it comes to death, uh, because God, and this is where if you're taking notes, you might want to write a few notes to the side. Because God is righteous, that's what, that's what I write to the side. Because God is righteous, he needs to bring a penalty or a punishment toward our sin. We talked about this at Easter, that there's no righteous judge in Delray Beach who, if I came to him or her and said, I've, we found the person, we can prove that this is the person that entered my house and killed those two children. There's no righteous judge that would say, it's not really that big a deal, dude. We're just going to dismiss this one. You'd go crazy. You would be like, justice! We have hearts that cry for justice, rightly so, because they're fashioned after a God of justice. And that God of justice, when he sees sin, when he sees people who defy his call for how they should live, he has to bring a penalty. And the penalty for our sin is death. Now, there's three types of death. That's also there in your outline. There's three, you may not have heard that. You might not have thought of death as a, as a punishment. You might have thought of it as like a natural sort of course of life. <clears throat> death is not natural. We were not supposed to die. Death is a consequence of the fall. It's a consequence of sin. People were not supposed to get cancer. Children, students were not supposed to get shot. We were not supposed to age the way that we age. All of that stuff is part of the consequence of living in a broken world where sin is still among us. And so the, the first death that, that 
we, we begin to see is, is, first of all, spiritual death. Because back in the garden, it said, Adam and Eve, you're going to die if you eat the fruit. And they didn't immediately physically die. What happened to them was they had to be removed from the presence of God. They spiritually died. So they no longer knew God the way he could be known. And then came physical death. Now Adam and Eve were going to get old. Now Adam was going to grab a bald spot like I have. Eve was going to like, it was, not only was she going to have pain in, in childbirth, thing, but like she was, she was going to get old and things weren't going to look the way they used to look. And then she was going to, she was going to die. Um, new concept to them. But the physical death is part of the consequence of sin. And then there's a last death that's a part of the consequence, and that's eternal death. Eternal death is, you know how we feel separated from God? And like, even if we know him, if you know him, you've been reconnected to God spiritually, but there's a day coming when we're going we're gonna to see God face to face. If you don't know God through the gospel, that separation that you feel right now is only going to become more intense because there's an eternal death for those of us who die outside of the good news of Jesus. And Jesus is very clear about that. It's called hell, and we spend eternity in hell under the wrath of God, rightly so, because he's a loving and just judge. That's bad news, man. Three types of death. We're experiencing two of them right now. Spiritual death, although some of you have been made alive again spiritually through Christ. I'm one of those people. Physical death, which we'll all experience unless Jesus comes back like right now. That'd be cool. Okay, it didn't happen yet. But if, he could, if it does, that'd be awesome. And then eternal death, where there's going to be separation forever for all those outside of God's grace. Well, where does that leave us? Well, the last part of the bad news is that works don't work. And see, this is where a lot of people get hung up on the gospel. A lot of people have a, they can accept like sin. They're not so sure about a God who would like punish sin. They like grandpa God and Santa God. They're not so sure about holy and righteous God. So they may or may not like that, but okay, we're just sharing what the scripture tells us. But people get hung up on this works idea. Because deep down, there's still a lie in my heart that says I can be good enough for God to accept me. That's why I don't really like that song about relentless love. I think it's one of the reasons. I can't, I, I can't pull it off and it angers me because in my religious pursuits, I want to be everything I sing about. And I haven't been able to pull that off yet. And it frustrates me, and it angers me, and it scares me. Because I think it's attached to this lie that I have to be something for God to really want me. And the gospel says, all you need is need. Yes. I'm enough. Come to me with your brokenness. So the thing about works is, man, they don't work. Good works don't work. It will never be enough to make yourself right with a holy and righteous God. You might work your way back into a marriage. You might work your way back into a job. But they don't have the standards of our holy God. And neither do they have the love. Because besides bad news, man, there's good news. There is good news. Once you understand the, the concept of those three things that the scriptures talk about as bad news, then it really sets up the love of God, the good news of God. And we move on to the next slide, which is, um, the, the three aspects of the good news. <clears throat> well, what are the three aspects of the good news? Well, we see that there's love at the center of these, of these six aspects. The love of God is dominant in the party of God. And here's, here's how I define, here's how the scriptures define love. Um, and you might want to write this to the side. Substitute. Substitute. God most beautifully expresses his love for you and for me by providing a substitute to do what we could never do. And the substitute is Jesus. That's how God defines his love. There's other ways where you can experience God's love. In his provision, in his gifting, um, in his healing. But check this out. They all go back to how Jesus on the cross expressed the love of God and healed your heart. Of how he provided for you to know God eternally. I mean, everything in life for the believer actually goes back and is captured in the cross of Christ. The love of God is most beautifully expressed as he provided a substitute at great expense to himself for people like me and for people like you. And the substitute, God the Father, sent God the Son to go to a cross and die for you and die for me. And then God the Spirit applies the faith that is necessary to receive that gift. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all present in the gospel. And where does that lead us? Well, it leads, it leads us to Christ. In this passage, it talks about Christ. And this, this passage has Christ being both, uh, you need to understand, he's both fully God and fully man. It's important to understand the personhood of Christ. He's, he's fully God, born of the Virgin Mary. That's significant because if he was just fully man, he would have inherited sin. And he wouldn't be able to take on your sin or mine because he'd have his own sin to pay for. He'd be like morally bankrupt like we are. But he wasn't. That dude was loaded. He had all the riches he needed to pay for you and to pay for me because he had no debt of his own. He was fully God, is fully God. But he was also fully man, which made him um, the acceptable sacrifice. He needed to become one of us to die in our place or else it wouldn't have counted. Fully God, fully man. And then finally, we end at the cross. We end at the cross and we see that, that Christ went to a cross and probably the two most, in word, most important words that you can remember as you're sharing the gospel is put and punished. On the, and this is where sometimes we miss the gospel. We, we can even take people up to this, this point in the gospel and we can miss it sometimes. It's important not to miss that God the Father put my sin and your sin on Jesus and then punished Jesus in our place. Jesus died and on the third day was resurrected. And his resurrection proves that he paid the price fully for our sin, that he overcame our sin and our death. And then the final one is the invitation. And this is our, if we can go to our next slide, this is where we put it all together. Um, there's, there's times when I might share the gospel, but I wouldn't invite somebody to believe the gospel. You see, the gospel is not just an announcement that you drop and leave. The gospel is actually an announcement, an announcement that requires a response. Have you ever gotten those announcements that say RSVP? I don't like those. Because that means, I'm, you know, I struggle with people pleasing, so that means I need to tell you, no, I can't come to your party. I'd rather just not show up and not respond, and then it would be cool. It wouldn't be weird or awkward when I saw you. But some of you put RSVP. Why do you put that? Because you want to know. It requires a response. The gospel is not just like neutral information. It requires a response. And so it's only loving for us as we're making the better invite to invite people to respond. What do you think about this? How is this hitting you? Is this, is this something that you would like to make your own? I mean, like dialogue with people because you should be sharing the gospel with everyone, but most especially people you're in meaningful relationships with. That's what we're talking about, re reimagining evangelism. Who have you already earned the space to talk about these things with? Talk about them. Invite them to the better part. Don't you want them to have what you have? Or are you not convinced that what you have is that good? Or maybe you just don't know how to do it. We're, we're trying, I'm including myself, we're trying to help us along in that journey to not only understand the party better, but to then also help one another make um, that better invite. And then on the invite side, helping people understand this is um, an invitation to, to be um, taken from one life to another. To, I, love, I love how we've been trending here at the Avenue Church. To be taken from their current party, which they're trying to find all their significance and meaning, to a better one. By faith, through grace. By faith, through grace. How do, you, how do you get to the party? You quit on yourself and you say yes to Jesus. You're like, yeah, I believe you did it. And I believe you have, the, I believe you're at the, I believe you're the new Mitch, man. You're at the center of the party, dude. You're just waiting. Like, you're calling me in. And by the way, it's a little theology here. Uh, Jesus doesn't just like wait for you. He, he comes and hits you. Don't make a mistake. Don't think like you're in control of all this. He's not only at the party, but he has this way of coming to get you. Remember the reckless love of God? And so when you're inviting people, you're simply inviting people to say yes to what God's already doing. You can't lose. If they say no, then okay. Love them, continue with them, and maybe, maybe God will start to do something later. Paul finished this passage by saying, I work harder. I worked harder. Well, what, are we, what did he work harder at? And so I just wanted to send you out here. I think the team's going to come soon. We're going to prepare our hearts to take communion, but I just wanted to give you, give you some parting thoughts about what Paul worked harder on. The first thing is, um, if, if, if you would, with me, reimagine the better invitation, if you want to reimagine the better invite, I think that we're all going to need to become a better party animals. I think we're going to need to learn how to party better than we do. Um, 
I don't want to cause you to, ch to chip off and stumble and fall, but I know that we have a, a, an amazing recovery population here. And I don't want to romanticize your days in the past when you were ripping and running. I just want you to think for a second. You went to some pretty extremes to go after your first party, right? I mean, you, you did some things that were costly because you felt the payoff was worth it. All I'm saying is let's redeem that. Let's redeem that behavior. Let's redeem that attitude and point it towards Jesus now. So whatever it is that you did in order to get your drug of choice back in the day, and if you're a normie here, you did the same things, you just didn't do them as good, okay? Apply that to pursuing Jesus. Man, I used to stay up late, I used to do this, I used to go around this person, I used to do this, I used to... Get after it when it comes to following Jesus. Work hard to get your Jesus on. Listen, man, it's by grace and by faith. You don't work hard to earn it. But if you want to know this person, if you want to experience some of the songs that we sing as your own, I mean, you got to get after it. You got to quit thinking that, hey, you know, this is just going to come to me. Like, hey, this is just, I'm just going to naturally get it. You're not going to naturally get anything. You're going to work harder because grace has affected you and the love of God has radically ravaged your heart and mind so that you got to get more of it. You're going to become addicted to Jesus. You're going to be all into Jesus. And as you pursue him through his word, through listening, through his people, through sharing his invite, and check this out, you're going to actually experience the better party. You're going to actually be like, yo, I got some freedom I never had. I have some peace I never had. I have some power in my life that I've never tasted. i got to tell you about it. Amen. That's not going to happen if you come Sunday to Sunday and sit in that chair and expect me to feed you. It's not going to happen if you listen to podcasts and do the, and every now and then kind of throw on a Christian song. Like, what are you after? Because whatever it is that you're after, you're going to get. You want to be awesome in your career? Okay. The Bible has nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. You want to be awesome as a parent? Nothing wrong with that. You want to be awesome as a student? Kill it out there. Great. Athletes, go for it. I'm all about it. But not at the expense of first things. And as a matter of fact, as you pursue those other things, you should be saying, as I'm learning how to be better here, I want to learn to enjoy the better party over here. I'm going to redeem my energy and efforts here, and I'm going to figure out how I can point them to Jesus. I'm not going to work hard to, to assure my salvation. I'm not going to work hard so that God likes me more. I'm going to work hard because God loves me right where I am, even if I stay there. He's not waiting for a better version of you. He just has more than we've experienced. And his desire is to give it to you. God loves you right where you are, but loves you too much to leave you there. Just join him. Don't misunderstand, it's not work salvation. But this is, I worked harder because of grace. Man, I got after it. I hope you understand that difference. Second thing is um, become a better party aficionado. Aficionado. Aficionado is somebody who knows a lot about it. My wife just became a, a, an event planner. She actually throws parties. Maybe that's why I'm so into the better party. I don't know. But here's the deal. She was like a kindergarten teacher. You know, and then she was a tutor. And now she's at all these like high-end events and things like that. And she's the, she's the responsible to throw the better party. And so you know what she's done? I mean, she has the gift of hospitality. She's super cool. I mean, I love her to death. But like, she didn't know much about event planning. So you know what she did? She learned. She learned. We would be eating food, and she would like look it up on her phone to know what it is and to be able to talk about it with guests and things like that. I mean, she went to work. She learned and became like a party aficionado. She didn't just think that by being around the good party, she would become an aficionado. She has got, she, she went to work. She worked harder. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Learn the gospel, man. Like, learn, we share the gospel in this church pretty much every week. Very similar to the way I just shared. That's why I was encouraged to preach this message. Mitch was like, why don't you like teach through what you share every week? I'm like, okay, I'll do that. Thanks, Mitch. Good idea. You should learn how to share it. Like, memorize it. Like, memorize the six points. I mean, don't you do that when things are important enough to you? Don't you, like, 
wrap your, do whatever you can to wrap your mind around something if it's that important to you. Learn the gospel, apply it to your heart, but then learn how to apply it to somebody else's heart. Do whatever you have to do to learn how to make the better invite. We've given you a tool. If you like the three circles, if there's another tool, okay, cool. But learn a tool, like memorize it, like humble yourself and say, I would know in a pressure situation how to share this gospel of mine if somebody asked me. Because you know you'd be like, ah, I don't know, Jesus. Church, just come, we'll figure it out, right? I mean, you get all nervous, you're like, I don't know what I'm I do too. Like, it's okay, memorize the play. Tom Brady knows the plays. Know the play. Finally, become a better party advocate. You guys know Janice? Janice, she's our women's director. She's an advocate. She goes to the, uh, an advocate is somebody who speaks on behalf of something else. She goes to the children's garden and she's, she advocates for Jesus there. And, and we were in a meeting together and she's like, you know what, we really do have the better party. Love that. She really believes we have the better party. Now she can advocate for that. She can speak on behalf of someone or something else. And she can plead and urge and invite because she sees herself as an advocate. But in order to be an advocate, man, you gotta practice. Practice the gospel on yourself. Practice sharing it with your family. Practice sharing it in safe environments and then go out there to your own garden and make it better. I'm gonna invite you to the table now. Uh, we call this the communion table. And uh, the communion table is really the center of our better party. It's the feast, if you will, because it's what Jesus gave us to remember, his death and his resurrection. And as we take it, the scriptures say you should examine yourself and not take it in an unworthy manner. And what that means is that, well, you should say, Am I, do I believe what he just shared or not? Because if I don't, it would be unworthy for me to take communion because I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm embracing this. So that, that's cool. Just, just hang out, we're going to play a song, think about what was said, just spend some time with you know, kind of thinking through that stuff. But it would also be unworthy if, if the Lord has brought about an area of sin in your life, and you're like, no, God. I prefer my own Godship over yours. I'm choosing to find my life outside of you. If you're in that space where God's made clear to you, this needs to stop, and you're like, I'm not ready, then we believe the scriptures to mean that, that you, should, you should wait today and actually ask God to do business on your hard heart. And then the next time we offer communion, we try to do it once a month, come and celebrate the work that God's done in your heart. If you find yourself really needy, if you find yourself really needy and looking for Jesus to be the hero of your soul story, looking for Jesus to be your savior, your master, your everything, you don't have it right. You're still super messy. But you got your eyes on Jesus and you're like, I need that. Then we invite you to come. You'll take a piece of bread and a cup of juice and go back to your seat as the song is played and then I'll come back out and waltz it. Father, help us in this moment to reflect and to have our hearts prepared by your spirit. Jesus, meet us and spiritually nourish us now. Amen. You can come to either table when you're ready. Man, I think I could just keep singing that over and over again. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear because you're the better part of it. And we get sent by people too. Now may that same Jesus bless you and may he keep you. May he make the darkness that you still have in your life tremble even right now as I speak these words over you. And may he silence the fear that's been with many of you for years. May he silence it even in this moment as you say his name with me. Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.